thank you arindam for joining me today for the first session of our video series on uh, get your next promotion i would like to thank you once again for sharing your wonderful story for the book your story definitely shares a very important perspective in the book for the purpose of my readers and viewers arindam haldar is the chief executive officer at sri diagnostic private limited which is one of the leading diagnostic organizations in india Arindam is a business leader with two and a half decades of cross-industry experience in a variety of roles, including sales, marketing, operations, P&L, and change management roles. Arindam makes time to pursue his passion in long-distance endurance running and going for experiential driving vacations with family. And of course, uh, COVID has made this last part a bit challenging. I would like to share with our viewers that uh, you can read Arindam's story in the fourth chapter on the topic of horizontal growth in the book Get Your Next Promotion. It's definitely a very interesting and intriguing topic. Thanks, Arindam, for bringing out such an in-depth perspective about this subject. Uh, Arindam, to start with our conversation today, I understand that there were some moments in your career. when you had yet to realize the importance of horizontal growth and change was a bit of frustrating experience for you i'm reading out a few lines from the book if you're okay with that so sure, manvi the first few months were very frustrating as i had gotten so used to my independence in the earlier profile it was a humongous task to rewrite business processes right from sales forecasting demand planning to running rough cut capacity planning material requirement planning vendor scheduling long range business planning with one of with one set of numbers running across the company i had to work with people who were senior to me not only in age but experience as well and i was telling them to do things differently from what they had been doing for the last 20 30 years and it was not easy Arindam, can you please tell our viewers and book readers more about your experience at that particular time? Sure, sure, Manbir. And uh, to start off, uh, thank you uh, once more to have me on this chat session. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, you have been over generous in your uh, introduction of me, so thank you again uh, for the same. Uh, you know, uh, it's interesting that uh, you have actually picked up. Uh, this part of my story because somehow i believe that this was probably one of the most uh, what you call defining moments in the early part of my career so i'll give you a little bit of perspective before getting in a little more detail into it uh, godrich billsbury a company which later became general mills india was the global merger of the two large package uh, package good companies in uh, us minnesota based billsbury and general mills uh, this was the company uh, which was my second job Uh, after Colgate, and uh, post the first uh, few years there, uh, when honestly I honed my sales and marketing skill more as a continuation of what I did in the first three years of Colgate, mm -hmm. I was actually given an independent charge of a very interesting job profile. Uh, it was a little different from a standard way our career develops. Probably the first sort of discontinuity, as they call it. Uh, yes, it was a horizontal move, but to set up a business. and it was a business vertical uh, very different from the rest of the business of general mills india where this was a business uh, and general mills is a packaged food company for our readers uh, it's one of the largest packaged good uh, foods company in the world and yeah. uh, this business vertical was focused on targeting the 20 million plus nris and pios people of indian origin non resident indians who are settled around the various parts of the globe uh, to build a very niche business of packaged indian food aiming at giving the diaspora the test of home that they very dearly miss so that mm -hmm. was the whole proposition of this business and honestly i set the business up from practically scratch mm -hmm. uh, it grew to become a sustainable and highly profitable pnl for the organization it's a small business but it was mm -hmm. a niche business very profitable it honestly gave me a very you know you can say a semi entrepreneurial kind of a kick at yeah. a very early age of my yeah. career uh, yeah. i probably was what my uh, very early 30s late 20s early 30s probably uh, you know and uh, uh, you know that was a time when my boss and this was a boss who has stayed my boss for more than 10 years and i'm still connected he's one of my mentors he's a mentor for life and uh, he actually asked me to move out of that operating and a pnl leader role to mm -hmm. take up a very critical business process transformation project mm -hmm. you know and uh, 
while I could sort of vaguely sort of understand that this must be a very important project in the overall General Mills uh, global scheme of things, mm -hmm. I somehow, you know, at that age, just couldn't digest that. Why should I, you know, give up on something that I have so successfully and painstakingly developed? So it was actually a very difficult decision for me to accept. And one of the main reasons for me to accept is my trust in my leader. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's important because you need to trust your leader and, uh, and yeah. the leader, obviously, as a leader, uh, one has to invest in one's people. And that's what I saw from my bosses. I have been very uh, you know, fortunate to have those kinds. And I probably try to emulate a little bit of that uh, in my current role as well. So in summary, let me talk about the project now. Uh, yeah. This was part of uh, General Mills' global initiative. Uh, they yeah. did across five critical markets, India being one of them. And uh, they sort of brought, wanted to bring about significant uh, business process transformation, making sure that General Mills works on a unified set of processes across the globe. There's a single version of truth as regards number in each of the country operating units so that all the numbers mm. can be rolled up. Uh, so it was important for General Mills. This was about, I think, uh, four or five years after uh, they bought over uh, Pillsbury, so it was important to integrate the two large businesses. So it was very critical from a strategic priority of General Mills, it was very, very critical. Yeah. I was the lead for India and mm -hmm. together with the rest of the team, we rewrote about 59, if I remember correctly, business processes and mm -hmm. running across the entire length and breadth of the uh, organization on how sales focus should be done on say how to have more efficient rough cut capacity planning as you talked about RCCP, uh, yeah. DRP, MRP implementation at the factory locations, how to have a more robust forward PNL view, how to have a very KPI based discussion at management business review which is conducted by the MD. So you know one looked at the entire uh, you know plethora of processes on basis mm. which an organization runs yeah. and we rewrote processes there was strict guidelines we worked with a global consultant who helped us doing that uh, and honestly I'll not get into too much of detail into the project I would encourage uh, viewers uh, to actually read the chapter to know more about the skills that I picked up during the time mm -hmm. but it would honestly suffice to say uh, mm -hmm. let me tell you what I did after one and a half years of project completion I actually went back to my uh, boss and this was a fantastic experience of course I worked with the other country leads across those other four geographies uh, mm. overall project leader was a senior person based out of Minneapolis which was the headquarter of General Mills we got recognized globally uh, for successfully doing the project getting the highest honor that General Mills gives annually uh, but I actually more than that award I actually went back to my same boss uh, about two years later to say you know what I cribbed when you gave me the role, but this was probably the best paid general management, uh, you know, sort of uh, role that one can ever get. So I realized it two years later. I did not realize what he was pushing me for. Uh, he was doing it for good of mine. I was feeling that he's sort of neglecting me. Mm -hmm. And this project actually sort of gave me a bird's eye view of how, you know, each department in an organization, mm -hmm. any organization, any industry is sort of intertwined. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, to ask me that where my feeling came in that running an organization is almost akin to conducting an orchestra, you know, where there are individual mm -hmm. talents, you yeah. need to make sure those talents, those notes, they all need to be harmonized together for yeah. the overall symphony. And uh, that's the role of the conductor. And that sometimes is the role of uh, a business leader leading mm. uh, a functional role. Yeah. And that's the realization that uh, came in after mm -hmm. uh, lasting through it. So it was a fantastic experience, but I agree. I thought it was a bad move, but it turned out to be one of the most defining moments uh, in my overall career. Wow, wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I love the metaphor you used, orchestra. Yeah, love the metaphor. Thank you for sharing that metaphor. Um, Arindam, I'm also curious, you know, in the current scenario, a scenario of pandemic affected world, how do you see the business world getting changed? So uh, let me say this, you know, like, uh, you know, all of us know that we are actually living through this current time, which is so unprecedented. So to say that it's practically impossible to sort of mm. predict the future, how, how, what will happen. Yeah. Uh, you need to stay in the present. Yeah. Saying that uh, I do some, I see some fundamental shift in some aspects of uh, doing business. Mm -hmm. uh, in this increasingly connected world, but at the same time, I see some other core concepts of doing business still remaining the same. And uh, mm -hmm. I can 
uh, sort of explain what I believe will probably may change mm-hmm. uh, with my current view and that view may change in three months time, six months time, who knows. Yeah. Uh, and some of it will may still remain the same. So let yeah. me try to sort of uh, think aloud here. So some of the changes I do see that uh, I think at least in the medium term, we'll see a more insulated world. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is important because more and more what we have seen in the last decade, uh, the world has become a global village. Yeah. Global corporations uh, think through a seamless global market approach yeah. where their supply chain should be, where their market should be. They can mm. go and set up a factory in the low cost market. They can sell in a high priced market and everything is a seamless uh, one geography with the kind of connectivity we have both in Mm. physical connectivity and virtual connectivity uh you know countries probably did not matter to most of the fortune 500 global corporation maybe maybe global economy you know in this trying times i believe that every country will start thinking about how to protect its own interest before others and there will be a little bit of insulation that will happen it mm-hmm. will still be a survival of the fittest, whether in mm-hmm. terms of the economics or in terms of corporations. Yeah. And talking of businesses, I think uh, those extremely agile corporations uh, will not only uh, you know, survive, but will probably prosper as well during the time. Yeah. Uh, sustainability, lean management will be the dominant themes. Mm-hmm. Uh, businesses obviously are all trying to work towards uh, mm-hmm. of, you know, work with a far lower fixed cost model. Yeah. Uh, cash will remain king in the foreseeable future. Corporates uh, will need a formal business continuity plan defined. So a lot of those things uh, will change. Yeah. Uh, you know, so th- those will change. Uh, talking about uh, related to the sector that I belong today, uh, which is healthcare, I believe uh, uh, both consumers, customers and governments investment and focus on health related areas will go up, bound yeah. to go up rather. Yeah. And that may work well for countries like India, which has extremely poor health infrastructure. So that those are the changes that will happen. However, all said and done, mm. I have some fundamental belief that, you know, trade, and I'm talking about trade from the days of middle ages, say, for example, until the time the business, which is a form of a trade, right, of yeah. exchange of yeah. uh, goods and services, uh, some of the fundamentals don't change. So mm. if you talk about the early days until now, yeah. Business and trade is always about first figuring out a need or a demand of a particular customer, servicing yeah. that customer's demand in an efficient manner in exchange of something that is of value to the service provider. Yeah. So in the early days, it used to be a barter system, as you know. And yeah. today, probably cash and its uh, you know other forms, other mechanism. But that fundamental will not change. Yeah. Uh, whether COVID or not COVID, that fundamental will not change. Mm-hmm. But how the service delivery will happen, mm-hmm. that may change. So, you know, if I can give some cross-industry examples, and uh, I've become a little sort of industry agnostic, probably having worked in yeah. CPG, FMCG, you know, a little bit uh, mm-hmm. in tech companies, a little bit uh, in, of course, healthcare now. So, if yeah. you talk about uh, FMCG. Uh, mm. You know, the role of standalone Kirana shops, people were almost writing off Kirana shops uh, maybe 10 years back when the yeah. modern format came in. Yeah. Uh, they have survived. And in fact, in the today's day, their role has suddenly gone up significantly. The demand mm. from the consumer hasn't gone down. Yeah. But probably consumers are thinking twice about going to a large, potentially crowded supermarket. They are preferring a standalone yeah. you know, neighborhood Kirana. Yeah. Uh, you know, talk about entertainment industry. Uh, mm. Is our demand for entertainment going, going down? Absolutely not. In fact, uh, with all of us staying at home, probably the and uh, there are very few opportunity for external or outgoing entertainment. Mm-hmm. The role of entertainment or screen based entertainment is going up. Yeah. So the you know the the modality of delivering that uh, uh, sort of entertainment format is through OTT and not necessarily moving screening. Yeah. So the format of delivery is changing. I mean, talk mm. about restaurant business, food mm. is a passion of mine. Uh, you know, probably the fine dining restaurants will take time to develop, but the food service models, uh, cloud kitchen model will prosper. So talk yeah. about any industry, uh, you know, talk about uh, diagnostics, uh, probably walk-in of patients uh, into a lab will go down, but the home collection and, uh, you know, uh, booking through app will go up. So yeah. any any industry, any and every industry, the mode of delivery will change. So organizations yeah. need to understand, as I said, more agile you are as a corporation, you will sense this early on and you will be very, very successful because the fundamentals of demand will not change. Fundamentals of business uh, uh, will, will not change. 
So yeah. that's that's the long and short of what will happen, I think, because of the pandemic. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And I'm understanding what I'm getting is uh, fundamentals will remain same, but the world is actually going to change a lot, you know. Uh, uh, and uh, this is also going to affect, I'm sure, professionals in their career growth. And uh, with that yes. note, you know, uh, let me read another paragraph uh, from your story here in the book. People think career is a straight line journey or progression. And they are always scared that if they make a horizontal move, they might lose two or three years of their professional life. This line of thinking is like that of a student who's afraid to change school in the middle of the academic year, afraid that his grades might suffer. Would you like to share on this perspective with your with our viewers, uh, Arindam? Sure. This is actually actually very very real. I talk to so many young people in my organizations, yeah. and uh, it's real. When I you know I was younger, much younger than what I'm today, and I see this uh, in so many other young professionals as well. Uh, what I would like to actually say is, you know. Uh, Let's use metaphors as well. Again, I love metaphors. Uh, career actually mimics life, right? I mean, mm -hmm. everything that we learn in life from the time a baby learns how to walk on her own to how all of us have been kids, how we have you know, learned how to cycle or swim, everything involves a discontinuity. So mm. sometimes this whole feeling that we have that, you know what, career is an arithmetic progression. That is yeah. fundamentally flawed. Mm. Any change comes with discontinuity, comes with steps, comes with not a straight line. It goes through many curves, many turns, uh, ups and downs. Uh, so that's how life is and that's how career is. And if you look at any organization and most organizations as they call is a pyramid. Uh, you start in a particular level and you start sort of going up. That's the sort of conventional way of thinking through career growth. Conventional yeah. way, of course, there are lots of new yeah. age organizations today which are completely flat i'm not talking about those but conventional organization still has a little bit of pyramid structure uh, need to understand that each layer and first yeah. of all there are multiple roles in each layer one mm. layer doesn't mean one role right yeah. uh, and each of those roles have different competence different skill sets but the requirement of each layer is fundamentally very different so it is not that there is a layer a and a layer b mm. and layer b is not a little more of layer a yeah. And layer C is not a little more of layer B. So that's fundamentally wrong. I mean, uh, a vertical progress is very easy uh, to do. If you mm -hmm. are you know, lucky enough to be in an organization or be in a particular department or role where everything is a little more of the current. Yeah. It can be. I mean, like say, for example, uh, you can be in a very focused R&D job, you know, R&D scientist and you know, you are focused in a particular, uh, you know, experiment and more depth you have, better it is. And you keep yes. on doing the same thing and the passion that drives you and nothing wrong in that. Uh, yeah. But typically organization or a bigger corporate jobs that most of us do, it's not that narrow focused. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you need to understand that uh, as one becomes more and more senior, uh, the fact is competence of the skill to do a job matters less. And how you navigate the organization, how you manage people, how you deal with cross-functional conflicts, those matter a lot. And as you become more and more senior, they actually become the dominant theme. And the personal uh, skill sets become less important. They always yeah. remain important, but they yeah. remain less important. Yeah. So, you know, you need to build up complementary skills in the early age, which mm. then helps you as you move up, it's easier to take what I call horizontal moves and yes. early age, because yeah. of course, as you understand, if you see a, a pyramid, there are less roles on the top. There are more roles below. Yes. So yeah. fact is you have more probability of getting more horizontal roles in the early age, in the middle career, there yeah. are less probability and the life becomes tougher there. So yeah. once you have already moved up there without too many horizontal moves, you will find it that much more difficult mm. and what people think wasting. So, I mean, quote unquote wasting two or three years in moving into a horizontal move I mm. feel may actually cut down for all you know five years in a later mm. part of your life mm. uh, when you are reaching for your next uh, dream role yeah. so uh, I would very strongly advise uh, all young professionals to be very open to seeking horizontal moves not as a career limiting uh, option but mm. as a career enhancing option yeah yeah 
Yeah. And thank you for explaining in such a detail about those career levels and career progression. Um, how does it all apply now in today's pandemic affected world? What's your perspective on that? I guess uh, it actually applies more. Uh, in mm -hmm. today's world, it actually ap applies more. As I told you a little while back, on, and the pandemic has made many of our fundamental way, uh, you know, ways of yeah. operating redundant. Yeah. Uh, all of us have been forced to think outside the box. We yeah. have looked at new delivery systems. We have innovated on the fly. Uh, things that were unthinkable, uh, maybe yeah. four months back, have all become a reality. Uh, mm. Cognitive agility of, of, is of extreme importance today. Uh, mm. We must retool, retrain ourselves to survive. I mean, that mm. is what it is. And then, you know, uh, what I talked about being open to taking complementary skill mm. is probably 10 times more important today during pandemic than it was before mm. pandemic. And career yeah. is a sum total of all that one learns through various phases and stints. And we should be, I guess, more and more open to, uh, you know, horizontal moves that, yeah. that will upskill them at this stage. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, when the situation improves, uh, all of us will actually become a better professionals uh, at that point in time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the one word which I'm hearing again and again is agility. And it's one of my favorite words, agility. It could be mental agility, leadership agility. Yeah. Agility is very important. Uh, uh, on that note, uh, Arindam, I'm going to, uh, you know, read another extract from your story. From, uh, for all mid to senior level managers, it's important to first understand that if you are on plateau or a tabletop, it is not a bad thing. Sometimes people beat themselves up for this situation, which is not right. A plateau is higher than plain with a nice overall view. You have already achieved something. Therefore, you should take cognizance of the fact that you're not at the bottom of the pile. It's a place where you can rest a bit before you start the next phase of your journey. Wow, very interesting point. So Arindam, how do people recognize that they are on plateau and what should people do about it? Sure, I think uh, uh, wherever we are in our career, we need to ask ourselves, I guess, pretty frequently on whether we are you know, sort of learning new things uh, on the mm. job. Whether we are looking mm. forward every day to new and different work problems that challenge us when we come to office. Uh, you know, sometimes we are in perfect ease. Mm. Uh, you know, you can hit that as complacent um, in what we are doing today. Yeah. And sometimes that to me is the real problem. Because if that is a warning sign as well, because at any point in career, if you have the ever feeling that you know it all and it's a cakewalk and you to the extent that you're almost getting bored to do the same thing day in day out yeah. uh, maybe heading or worse still you may be already on a plateau and mm -hmm. that's not a good thing this happens more in the mid career stage and the way to probably come out of it is not necessarily always switching jobs uh, you mm -hmm. know it's about looking for a new meaning even in the current role or within the organization as I said earlier taking complementary uh, skill set uh, if you allow me to I'll again get into another metaphor of uh, yeah. another passion of if I, do I have the permission to do that oh please do so <laughs> so yeah, I'll talk about running you know like and you yeah. have to stop me at some point in time because when I start talking about running probably I get a little uh, overawed and I keep talking about it. I know in your <laughs> introduction you spoke about a little bit as well. So I'm a recreational road runner. So by no means I am a you know uh, good runner or a big runner. I'm probably average, lower average in terms of any parameter. But I actually love running. I mean, like it's as I call it my form of morning meditation. Uh, I get my me time while running. So I actually genuinely like running. So I'll give you an example of uh, plateauing in running. Uh, so, you know, when one starts one baby steps in distance running and yeah. maybe you should try it sometimes as well. It's easy to see very noticeable and very uh, easy way. You know, first time when you run, you huff and puff to probably run unbroken 400 meter. Yeah. And from 400 meter to a 5k run doesn't take, you know, you never know. I mean, you'll be amazed that in a few weeks time, a um, few months time, you'll actually be able to run a 5k without actually stopping. And that can yeah. happen quite fast. Yeah. And uh, you know, as one falls in love with running and then, uh, you know, many a times you find yourself in a position that beyond a point, however much sort of you try running the same course day after day, week after week, 
we seem to be not improving our running efficiency. You know, you're not running any faster or you're not putting any less effort to run the same distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not that that's a bad thing. You're running well, you're running a decent distance. Uh, that itself is a very good thing. It releases dopamine. You're doing uh, very, very well. You're feeling happy about it, but you're not improving anymore. Mm -hmm. To me, that's the same plateau concept mm -hmm. in running. Yeah. And, and when that happens, Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do? And, and these are, again, science talking uh, and you can read up and I do reading up a little bit as well uh, on running because I like uh, doing that. What, what do you do? You actually spice it up a little bit. What do you do? You vary your running course. Maybe you go on an incline one day, you get into a trail one day, uh, mm -hmm. you start running short distances at a much faster pace, take a breath, run sh shorter distances again, uh, you know, keep changing things. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you go on a uh, interval running, tempo running, you know, there are various t uh, terminologies that runners will know. In simple terms, what do you do? You push your body and your mind to try alternate running experiences. Sometimes you pump up your heart rate, you work out your quadriceps, say when you uh, repeatedly run on a hill incline. Yeah. All of this, what you're doing is you're giving different shock to your body, different experiences, dip different learning ability to your various m muscles of your body, which will help you when you run your race later. And yeah. more often than not, when you come back to your regular course, you will probably run at a faster pace or you will run with a lot less effort. Mm -hmm. So the point is, that, you know, I hope you've got the drift by now. The reason I spend so much of time in running is this is what you need to do while in your career plateau. You need yeah. to make your work life a little more interesting by learning something new every day, mm. read up something that's happening in your field, other markets, other geography, join an mm -hmm. online course, mm -hmm. learn from your peer group, you know, mm -hmm. engage in your professional network. All mm. of these will help you understand what are your own strengths, what are the complementary yeah. uh, skill sets and improvement areas yeah. uh, so that you are conscious about what next steps you require. And if you mm. do all of that, uh, one is you will do your current job better. Mm. Chances are you will figure out new dimensions of your job, which we were not sort of recognizing earlier. Mm. And of course, you can also take up a alternate role as well. So all of that yeah. uh, helps. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. I'm also inspired to run now, actually. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is uh, uh, take ownership, strengthen your muscles, develop yourself, plan for it and develop it. Um, yes. You know, and um, I don't know if it's the last question uh, of this, uh, of this uh, session today. Uh, what are the three main qualities people should have to prosper in current environment? Uh, okay, so actually, if you see uh, in today's so-called uncertain world, I mm. see a lot of people sort of reminisce about their past mistakes or many a times they are very scared of what will happen because the future is always uncertain and today's yeah. day it's even more uncertain. Yeah. My first advice uh, is to all of us to stay in the present because present is always beautiful. Yeah. And if you can stay in the present and handle the current crisis, as we say, take every day as it comes. There's no way any future uncertainty can shake us off. So mm -hmm. my first uh, you know, advice would be to stay in the present, not mm -hmm. get too bogged down by the past and don't get too scared about the future. Second, uh, I, and this is something that I very strongly believe in, that never, never compromise on your fundamental value system and professional integrity, even if one is sort of tempted uh, in such trying times. This pandemic to me is a true character building time for all of us professionals and mm. what we do now will define mm. our future. Mm. And uh, probably last but not the least, uh, be kind to people who are in greater need than yourself. A natural act of kindness every day, uh, a little bit of charity every day. And this is, I'm not talking about that you invest uh, in a particular fund and get an ATG certificate. It's about the simple acts of charity every day. Uh, this honestly keep, helps keep our own sanity. Yeah. And of course, makes the world a better place. So those will be all my three advices to people. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much, Arindam. Thank you so much for that. And uh, those were some very, very useful tips for people who are looking to thrive in the current environment. And do not let the situation deter them from seeking their next promotion. Thanks again, Arindam, for joining me on the Sketch Your Next Promotion video series. I'm sure Thank that you. many Thank people... You. Welcome. My pleasure always. Uh, I'm sure that, you know, many people uh, will take benefit from the perspective you have shared today, even in the book, you know, so in his chapter. So 
the perspective you shared are really really very helpful thanks everyone for watching this video to read arindam's complete story and learn from other lessons he has shared in the book please get your own copy of the book and see you all again in the next video of the series and don't forget to subscribe to this channel and click on the bell icon thank you and all the very best thank you manveer and uh, thank you all viewers uh, for listening in thank you